Well, of course, I'm just excited to, to sit down and, and talk to you about mm -hmm. this book, Imani. And I mean, the, the reason is because I feel like the people asked for it. My last book, which was the history of, of racist ideas, yes. stamped from the beginning, mm -hmm. I also chronicled the history of anti-racist ideas and, and really sort of showed their collision, their clash, mm -hmm. the debate between them over time. And so when I would speak about that book, I would, I would encourage people to be anti-racist. I would encourage them to sort of move away from the racist ideas that have been ingrained in them. And so the more I spoke about being an anti-racist, the more people were like, okay, tell me a little bit more. Because as you know, people are taught in this country to be not racist. And so this construct of being anti-racist was new. So the more people asked how to be an anti-racist, the more I realized that this, this was a book um, and I, feel, I felt like I could potentially answer it. Well, I think first and foremost, let's think about the, how this term not racist ha is emerging currently and right. how has it emerged historically. And so people typically say, I'm not racist when what? When they're charged with right. being racist. And, and I don't think even well-meaning people, even people who are trying to be part of the movement against racism recognize really that the history of this term. So when a eugenicist were classified as racist, they said, I'm not racist. When, when right. Jim Crow segregationists were charged with being racist, they said, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. and, and now today, even white nationalists, I'm not racist, racist right. no matter whether they're in the White House or you know, uh, planning the next mass shooting. And, and so I don't think people realize how much fundamentally this has been a term of denial that mm -hmm. that has really all I've been able to really uncover of its meaning right. has been this sort of way to deny and you know one's own racism mm -hmm. anti-racist has a clear philosophy it has a clear history and and I think that's I think many people say they are not racist because they think racist is like a tattoo. They'll put, somebody will put a racist on their forehead, they'll never be able to escape it. They think it is a fixed category. They believe it is a fundamentally a bad person, a person who is hooded, who is a, a segregationist. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, I'm not in any of those things. I'm a good person, right. I'm against the Klan, I'm not racist. Right. But it's a descriptive term, right? And it describes what a person is, is doing in the moment. And so right. when a person is saying that um, a particular racial group is, is inferior, they're being a racist. When, when a person is right. doing nothing in the face of racial inequity, they're being racist. When a person is literally supporting persons and policies um, and power that is creating and reproducing racial inequity and injustice, they're being racist. And, and I think that emotional investment and people feeling like they're being attacked. Also, I think people don't realize the origins of that. Mm -hmm. The origins of the idea that racist is like the, the R word, that it is a pejorative. In fact, actually white nationalists in particular have been parroting that idea for decades. Because what they wanted to do is they so wanted particularly to get mm -hmm. white people to not recognize their racism. And if they don't recognize their own racist ideas, then white nationalists will be able to easily organize them. And, and, and to give an example, Richard Spencer, two years ago, who organized the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which, which led to, of course, the violence and the death of, of Heather mm -hmm. Heyer, he once said, as I talk about in the book, that racist isn't a descriptive term. It's a pejorative term. It's the equivalent of someone saying, I don't like you. I did not want to speak to people through my own personal story. Because as an historian, as a scholar, this is not the way we're sort of trained. And so that was, I was deeply hesitant. And then I'm deeply per personal and private. And so to really put some of the most shameful moments of my life um, on the page for all the world to see, was obviously very, very difficult for me to do. But at the same time, these ideas and structures and policies and powers at its core are impacting people, individuals. And individuals are either part of the forces that are challenging racist power 
or unknowingly or knowingly supporting it. And, and so fundamentally, because of that impact and because each of us are supporting or opposing racism, you know, ultimately, I wanted to sort of show that and how that operates on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, conceptually, and even all of the complexities within that. And in my case, you know, in certain, for most of my life, I was actually supporting and opposing. <laughs> racism or white supremacy without even knowing it. And so I thought the best way to do that was through my own personal story. So I obviously for a very long time thought black people could, could not be, be racist. racist. And, and I would have argued people, <laughs> for anyone who made that case. And I don't, I don't think it was, I believed that until I started researching for Stamp from the beginning. And until I conceptualized, I first defined a racist idea, and I defined it as any idea that suggests a, a racial group is, is inferior or superior to another in any way, and then I, that book was about anti-black ideas. And so then I went in search, and, and ultimately, one of the things I tried to do with that book was sort of take prevalent and prominent and popular ideas today and really sort of figure out its intellectual sort of genealogy. What was unavoidably the case was that black intellectuals were part of that intellectual genealogy. And I couldn't, even though I wanted to like exclude them or go around them, I just couldn't. You take the case of the, one of the most dominant and, and um, harmful um, anti-black racist ideas of the 20th century, was the idea of the broken black family and the patriarchal black woman. Um, I should say matriarchal, who was mm -hmm. harming the black family mm -hmm. and the black community and so on and so forth. That idea, of course, was popularized by, by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Moynihan right. as you know. But in his Moynihan report in 1965, he repeatedly cited a black scholar right. in E. Franklin, Franklin Frazier, Frazier right? who wrote the famous book on the, the Negro family in, in 1939, who also praised Du Bois, who said a similar thing in one of his black family mm -hmm. studies. And, and so I could not wrap my head around the fact that this idea about the broken black family was largely coined by a black scholar. And I think everybody now recognizes how um, harmful that idea is, how mm -hmm. it sort of justified the assault on welfare, the assault on black women, but justified so many assaults in the latter part of the 20th century. And so ultimately I'm saying that I think that was the first recognition of it. I could not um, separate the intellectual genealogy of some of these ideas. But I think what was critical was realizing what racist ideas do to people. And I realized that no matter the racial group, when a person was anti-black, when a person thought that there was something wrong with black people, they spent their time, intellectually and even in terms of organizations, either trying to civilize black people, attack black people, attack everything but the real problem, which was racism. And so that's how it literally functioned. And that's on the ideological perspective. Yeah. And, and then obviously when it came to like power and policy, I, I, I think that it is absolutely the case that black people have limited amounts of power vis-a-vis -vis white people, particularly within a white supremacist society. But to say that no black people have no power, right. it's just not true. And, right. and, and to also say that even 100 years ago, when we did not have all of these black elected officials, when we did not have a, a black person on the Supreme Court, uh, when we did not have so many black professors, we all still had the power to resist. And mm -hmm. some of us used that power, and some of us did not. Mm -hmm. Typically, those who did not, did not because they thought the problem was black people. And so, you know, it was sort of working through all of that that ultimately caused me to, to realize that, that black people can be racist too, particularly to black people, mm -hmm. and that ultimately internalized racism was the real black-on-black -black crime. I think it's a combination of factors. I, I think, first and foremost, I mean, this speech that I gave when I was a, a senior in mm -hmm. high school. Yeah. Um, and it was at a Martin Luther King oratorical contest. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the finalists. Um, so in other words, I had won my school competition and I was one of the three finalists across the county. Mm -hmm. And I spoke before 3,000 mainly black people. That's amazing. And mm -hmm. basically my speech was a litany of anti-black ideas, particularly about black youth. 
uh, black youth are the most feared in society, as if it was their fault. Right. I said things like black youth don't value education, mm -hmm. that black youth keep climbing this high tree of pregnancy, that all of these ideas about what was wrong with black youth, and ironically, as you know, if there was ever a decade in which seemingly everyone was coming down on the heads of black youth, it was the 1990s. And that's the decade in which I came of age mm -hmm. Um, and I consume those ideas and, and, and reproduce them. And you know, to your question, I, I think it's a combination of that across the ideological board, it is acceptable to say those ideas. So you know, I thought I was radical. Right. And so obviously black conservatives will say that. And I also you know, realized through some other work that, that I think not only in terms of the ideological popularity, but ultimately black people regularly see individual black negativity. And, and what we have been led to believe is that we can generalize that. I mean, we know youth that, that are feared because of what they're doing. We know youth that don't value education. And, and so because we know individuals like that, we just assume that, that that is part of the problem, not sometimes realizing that there are white youth who don't value education. There are white youth who are extremely violent. And not realizing, and, and I think I'll, uh, let me just say, I think one of the things I've tried to emphasize mm -hmm. is what makes black people equal to other racial groups is not our sort of great black people and our great attributes, it's our imperfection. We're Fully human, human right. And, 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 and I think I was trying to really anchor the book mm -hmm. in a way on this class perspective by making the case, and I should say by showing how I was largely raised in a black middle income home and the new black middle class of the 1980s understood themselves as a distinct racial group that was distinct from black poor people. In, in, in my parents were, were taught and to a certain extent believed that they were members of the black middle class because of their own hard work and ingenuity, which meant that people were still poor because they weren't working right, hard. Right. And, and so, it, and when we think of like racial groups and racial disparities and racial distinctions, we don't think intra-racial distinctions. Right. We don't think about how there is a such thing as white trash mm -hmm. that white elites have created to substantiate um, their beliefs in their own white inferior superiority. superiority. And, and so I, I think that class is, is absolutely sort of critical in understanding the way race sort of operates. And, and, and I think that we, when, I, when we speak about being anti-racist, it's not just saying sort of black elites are equal to white elites. It's black elites recognizing that there's nothing more with black poor people and that all they need is resources. And I also say that I think one of the most difficult things for people to realize, and it took me a while to accept this, is this, this idea that oppressive conditions literally are not just dehumanizing, but they actually make people into subhumans. That poverty literally depresses the behavioral and cultural sort of uh, attributes of mm -hmm black people, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. they are acting behaviorally deficient because they're poor. Mm -hmm. And what we don't realize is black elites, like white people and like other people, are creating their own standard of how people should act, assessing poor blacks from that standard and saying, oh, they're not reaching this standard because they're poor. And I, I think that ultimately I was trying to figure out what was the problem. You know, initially, I think when I graduated high school, I thought that the, rac the racial problem was largely black people. I, I thought also that it was racism, but what was, but was predominant was I thought it was black people. And then when I, a few weeks into my college life at, at FAMU in Tallahassee, mm -hmm. I, like black folk across Florida, experienced the election of 2000. Pretty much this voter suppression um, was ascendant and pretty much through the election to to, to George W. Bush in the faces of black people. And those firsthand and secondhand stories, mm. people's votes being spoiled, being turned away, were, were flooding into FAMU. So I heard racism, racism, white racism in, in particular, and, and so it was undeniable. And it ultimately caused me, I didn't really see it actually as racism at the time, I saw it as white people. Because many, almost all of the people who were engaged in these acts were white. And so then I went from, okay, the problem is black people, and to a certain extent racism, 
to the problem is black people and to a certain extent racism and white people. And then I was like, okay, what is wrong with white people? And that's when I went in search of all of those books, trying to figure out like what is wrong with these, these people engaged in these types of racist acts. And then ultimately, finally, when I really started engaging in study, particularly through, 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 through taking courses, I began to see that ultimately the problem was racism, and it took me a while to get to that point. I think as it relates to white people, one of their sort of anthems as it relates to race is, I'm not racist, right? And so obviously I wanted to confront that and say, there's only two options here. There's no such thing as being not racist. There's only being racist and anti-racist. And also there, there is a such thing as a racist right. and an anti-racist. Yes. It's not a fixed category, but if you say something that's racist, you're being a racist at that moment. And you have the capacity, though, to change. Even though you were raised to be racist, and I suspect the vast majority of white people in this country were raised either consciously or unconsciously to be racist, you still have the capacity to change, mm -hmm. to confront um, what you, in a way, are addicted to, um, and, and to be different. And, and, but in a way, to be different, to be anti-racist, is going to be a constant struggle. It's, a, it's, it's almost like a personality characteristic that we decided it as, as adults, we don't want to be that way anymore. It's not as if we can wake up one day and be like, okay, I'm no longer, I'm not that, right? I'm not yeah. that way anymore. Yeah. No, you yeah. literally, on a moment by moment, day by day basis, have to constantly self-critique, self-examine, mm -hmm. and, and, and strive to be anti-racist. And so that's obviously what I want white people to do while simultaneously, and I think I talk about this early in the book, Obviously, like many other writers, you know, it's critical for them to recognize their privilege mm -hmm. in so many different ways. And I talk about how even poor, poor white people have privilege. But then also for them to recognize why so many people of color are angry, are, are not only angry about racism, but even can show anger towards them, even when they may not have said or done something that is racist. A white person who's truly anti-racist has an understanding and is an empathetic to, let's say, black anger, particularly when it's racialized, because they understand the how, how insidious white racism is. They understand how it's very difficult for a person of color to pick out the good anti-racist white person in a crowd of racists. And, and so when they see that and hear that and feel that, they're empathetic. You know, that's also something I think that's critical in the book. You know Yava and Kyla. You know, the way that they are now, in which they are pretty unapologetic about their anti-racism, about their feminism, uh, about their sort of love of queer people. And, and of course, they were the same way then uh, yeah. as, as graduate students at, 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 at Temple. And I was coming from an experience at FAMU in which I really had never really engaged and understood black feminism. I really had never even considered and even deeply thought about um, black queer theory. And I don't necessarily, I, I, and I talk even in that chapter about, like my parents didn't necessarily raise me to be homophobic, but they, ne they did not certainly raise me to recognize um, that there was nothing wrong with black queer people. And so because of that, in many ways, I consumed many of the ideas about black queer people and certainly about black women. And so I arrived, like at Temple, was pretty much a, a homophobic sexist mm -hmm. and didn't even realize it. And they allowed me to realize that mm -hmm. because they created a, a, a community in which certain things were not gonna be tolerated. Attacks on black women, uh, attacks on, on black queer people were just not going to be tolerated in their presence. And, and, and I sort of, and, and they, what was interesting is they would, if somebody said something, you know, about particularly those two communities, they wouldn't like jump around their throat and just, you know, scream at them. You know, right. they would, of course, engage them. But I felt those as attacks. You know, yeah. I felt those as attacks, and, and I had to recognize why I felt those as attacks, even when they weren't talking to me. But what was beautiful was even though I had these homophobic um, ideas, even though I, I came there with this sort of gender and queer racism, they sort of opened themselves up to me, to sort of mentoring me, yeah. to befriending me, yeah. which I thought was absolutely sort of critical in my own personal development. Mm -hmm. And so any sort of 
uh, gender critique that I have, uh, any sort of critique of, of, of homophobia that I have, I, you know, I owe to those two, to those two women. Yeah, it, it um, one of the things that, that happened after Stamp from the beginning mm -hmm. when I started speaking about it, and, you know, and people started reading it is, people would say to me like, this book was so difficult for me to read. Reading 500 years of people de demonizing black people in every way imaginable obviously was, is very difficult for, for people who either care about ble black people or who are black to read. And so they would say, it must have been that much harder to write. And I would just, you know, <laughs> it would just go in one ear and out the other okay. just because I didn't want to even think about that. Mm -hmm. Like I was sort of so focused when I was doing the research and I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking about the impact that it was having literally and then combined with the fact that I was writing this history of racist anti-black racist ideas as a black person and you know the book ended up being 500 pages but I probably collected thousands and thousands oh, yeah. of pages of mm -hmm. ideas and many of which I had to sort of sift through and in, 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 in how to be an anti-racist, I talk about these as like trash bags that I literally like had to consume to basically make it legible for the reader. And at the time I was doing that, I was also caretaking my wife yeah. who had breast cancer. And it was obviously, you know, she was very young in her early 30s. And, you know, when you contract a disease, any disease, it's hard. But then when you contract a disease that you don't think you should contract because of your age, um, you know, it's, it's, it's even more difficult. And, and so obviously it was a very difficult process, um, you know, caretaking for her. And, and I in no way wanted to focus on my own physical health. You know, my wife had a serious illness. And so obviously I did not. And, and then a few years later, I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And friends asked me, well, do you think that in some ways was the effect of writing Stamp from the beginning, mm -hmm. of, of taking in all of that? I mean, they didn't use the term trash yeah. bags, but, but in taking all of that in into the gut. And, you know, um, and I didn't know, we'll never know, but certainly that could have been the case. As you know, I mean, scholars are finding now the literal health effects of, of racism. I mean, of course, I can never thank you enough for coming and, and, and sharing about your incredible biography, of course, of Lorraine. Um, but, I mean, we wanted, we have envisioned the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center as, as a space that convenes. I mean, there are so mm -hmm. many writers, for instance, right now, who are writing on racism, yeah. who are trying to sort of get us out um, of this pit that we've been in for mm -hmm. hundreds of years. And, and it's, as you know, we, we typically go to a book festival and we're, we're, there's only a few of us there. Uh, or of course we speak alone, you know, at mm -hmm. a, at a at, but it's rare that we come together um, at a festival um, and, and share our ideas. And so we felt that, okay, what if we convene some of the, you know, most impressive uh, intellectuals and writers, you know, mm -hmm. of our time mm -hmm. each year who are writing on this topic. And, and again, that's part of a larger mission to sort of convene and team up specialists to really take a more scientific approach to sort of how we're solving, I should say, how we're examining and solving this, this, this racial problem. In other right. words, we should be building teams of people. Mm -hmm. We should be convening people. To, to ask and answer some of the most intractable racial questions of our time. And oftentimes, as you know, we do this in isolation and we know part of the answer, right? And, and so we're like, okay, what if we bring those different parts together, whether it's you know, to have those conversations at the National Anti-Racist Book Festival, whether it's research and policy teams, or whether it's literally convening specialists in a field to create policy where, where it doesn't exist. You know, that's what we're trying to do, because, and ultimately, to be anti-racist, as you know, is to not just sort of think about and view people as, as equals. We right. literally have to be a part of this um, of this movement to change, whether we're changing the narrative, whether we're changing policy, yeah. or whether we're changing power. I think it's, it's up to the individual. I think every individual is standing in a different place and space. So mm -hmm. not every individual is like Professor Imani Perry, you know, a national and international mm -hmm. figure that can have these sort of national and international sort of conversations mm -hmm. and, and questions and, and be at these tables. You have people who their sort of 
standing in their place is their church. There's policies that govern that church. There are ideas circulating in that church. And are you a part of the movement in that church to dismantle racist policy, to uh, eject racist ideas from that church? Are you in a, being an anti-racist in that sense? You have people who, it's just their sort of local neighborhood. And you know their local neighborhood is gentrifying. And which part of that struggle are you on? Right. Um, right. You yeah. have people who just have a home, right? They don't necessarily have time to sort of join an organization um, because they're working 60 hours a week, but they do raise their children. And, and so they can be raising and training their children to be anti-racist. They can be sending a dollar or two dollar to an anti-racist organization that's, that's fighting against racist policy. You know, that's possible. They're yeah. being anti-racist when they do that. And so I think we should all think very clearly about where we are in the world you know, what places and spaces are we most passionate about? What do we have the capabilities to do? And formulate sort of our action plan, I think, around that. I just don't understand how structures are changed if they're not changed by individuals. individuals. And, and, and not only individuals, but the mobilizing and organizing of individuals. And, and so we have to simultaneously assess and push at the individual and structural level. I don't understand why we, we have to like, because you, you know, as you know, there's some people just want to look at the individual and just hide this the sort structure, of structure right. and say, oh, just we Madison. just need to take personal responsibility right. or, mm -hmm. and, or, and to me that's, heart, yeah. that's flawed in a different type of way. So I would say, I mean, as I think now in certain types of ways, you know, I'm seeking to challenge sort of policy in the state. And I think in that type of way, you know, someone as unapologetic as Malcolm, you know, obviously is someone who, who I admire in the sense that he's not only apologetically critical of the state, but he also, through his autobiography and even many of his speeches, he's critical about himself and he's critical of black people yeah. when they're sort of um, being, being racist. Um, and then obviously in terms of journalism, you know, as an essayist, um, as a writer for, for sort of popular uh, mediums, I'd say Ida B. Wells, who, you know, as you know, I mean, she literally, like, I wrote today in The Atlantic how she, I, we, I can almost feel her staring down a lynch mob um, and not, not moving. Um, and her focus was to sort of write for and to the people. Um, and willing, a willingness to say and do whatever um, to sort of challenge white supremacy right, right. and not be willing to, not backtracking in, in, in any bit. And then I think as a, as a sort of, all of that together, obviously Du Bois and the ability to simultaneously be involved in, in organizations, to be an essayist, um, you know, obviously I think more than any other scholar I, I look up yeah. to, to Du Bois. And the irony is, you know, at his time, you know, even personal narrative was something that was utilized, particularly by black scholars. And in many ways, we've moved away from that. Um, and oh, I think only true. now we're really starting, to, starting yeah. to move back to, to that. I do. Yeah. yeah. And I, I see it as, in, in a way, both confessional and conversion story, yeah. that I was constantly confessing and converting to, to someone new, mm -hmm. to, to someone sort of being more anti-racist. Yeah. And some of those essays, as you know, that he wrote and speeches he gave in the 1930s and 1940s mm -hmm. when he was critiquing himself. Self. I mean, to me, are just some of the most powerful sort of things he ever wrote. Um, and, and I think that as intellectuals, right, we're supposed to be critical. Right. Meaning we're supposed to be critical of ourselves, ourselves too. as well. I think for me, it's... I sort of have begun to distinguish between a public scholar okay. and public scholarship. And, and so for me, I, I view a public scholar as someone who is known by the public. But I don't want to be known. I don't want to just be known. I want to produce public scholarship, which I view as scholarship that literally impacts the, the lives yeah. of the public. And so when you talk about impacting, and, and in this case, sort of changing how people see the world, changing sort of racial narratives, you have to make the book accessible. You have to be able to sort of speak to the people. You have to present it in a way that people 
will consume it, right? Especially when you think about what we're at war against, right? And yeah. the stories, the ideas that is presented are also riveting, just in a different type of way. Like mm -hmm. this idea of just this massive invasion of people sort of coming to just destroy America and I am your savior. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, for people who think that there's something wrong with Latinx immigrants, it actually, to a certain extent, is, is riveting. And, and this right. is what we're up against right now. These obviously fictional stories that are presented as nonfiction. And I think that's part of the difficulty, right? Which oftentimes, racist stories have been fiction. In, in a way, that's what we're up against. We're up against fictional stories. And so when we present a, an alternative sort of view that's, I would argue, more accurate of the world, we have to produce it at that level. And so that's really what sort of drives me. And I feel like if, if I tell a story that doesn't sort of grip people, if I share an idea that people don't understand, I'm to blame. And so while others would see like, okay, these people don't understand when good storytelling or, you know, they're not, they don't understand this idea. No, I'm always to blame. At least I, that's how I understand. So then I go back to the drawing board and figure out new, a new and more effective way to tell that story or to share that idea. So I think for individuals, I mean, some of the best responses that people have said to me is when they've said something like, this book is liberating, in, yes. in, in the mm -hmm. sense that it, it allows them to no longer be confined by racist ideas, by this desire, for instance, as a black person to like represent the race well, this belief that because of what they've said and done in the past, that they can't be anti-racist tomorrow. And, and so, you know, I'm hoping that in a way sort of re removes those shackles, those yes. conceptual and even um, those shackles that, that allows people to really understand themselves and all their, their, their complexities to strive to be anti-racist. And then ultimately, I hope that this book helps with the work of other scholars like yourself to really build a movement, a social movement, a powerful movement, and powerful people who mm -hmm. are ultimately going to dismantle racism and white supremacy. Thank you so much. <laughs>